us all say amen. 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 Let us all say amen again. Amen. For truly, Lord God, has blessed us to be here this morning yes, with mobility in our limbs and sanity of mind mm -hmm. to assemble with each other and in his presence for no other purpose than to worship him in spirit and in truth. Amen. amen. The God that we serve is a good God. Amen. And he's so good to us, not because we've been so great or outstanding, mm -hmm. simply because he is good. Yes, yes. And he is God. Amen. amen. If you have your Bibles, please turn to the book of Matthew, chapter 11, verses 28 through 30, in the book of Matthew. I'm thankful to everyone who's led the different items of uh, the worship service. And I say thank you in advance to those who will lead us throughout the remainder of the service after the message. Uh, Matthew 11, 28 through 30. Come unto me, all you who labor, and a heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. The title of the message this morning is The Presence of Jesus. The Presence of of Jesus. And before we get into the message, I'm glad my, my brother is here with us on today. He uh, he brought his family with him. Uh, it's my sister-in-law, Lenitra, and the young man she's carrying is Lamarcus Thorne II. All right. And sitting next to them is my, my sweet niece, my one and only niece, Kyrie, Kyrie Thorne. All right. And I'm glad that uh, they are here with us, and they made the, the trip with him. Amen. Come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. When we look at the passage, our Lord is speaking, and he's inviting those who labor and who are heavy laden to come to him. And he says that those who come to him will receive rest. And he goes into detail about some other things. He says, take my yoke. You know, if you notice when the Lord says here to come to him, we don't even have to bring our own yoke. He already has a means. He provides the means for us to be connected to him. Mm -hmm. He says, and once we are yoked with him, learn from him. Or in the King James Version, learn of him. And what we will learn is that our Jesus, our King Jesus, is meek and lowly in heart. And he goes on to say, and after we learn about his meekness, and lowliness, that we will find rest for our souls. But there's another part of this that he shares with us in verse 30. He says, for his yoke is easy, and his burden is light. Which leads us to conclude that if we brought our own yoke, that our burdens wouldn't be lighter and our connection wouldn't be easy. Am I making sense this morning? I'm going to give you three words 
loving, lowly, and leisure. When we look at Jesus, he invites us to come and be connected to him. And he says that we will receive a light burden, we will receive rest. This aligns with the uh, concept of comfort as it's communicated in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3, 4, and following. Because when we analyze the word comfort, and we've talked about this before, comfort comes from a word uh, that describes inviting somebody to come stand by your side for the purpose of aiding and assisting. So Jesus invites us to come by his side, take on his, uh, take on his yoke, and we will have a light burden. But as we look closer in this, he offers something else. He tells us, he shows us some things about his presence. The first thing he shares with us when we look at verse 28 is we're able to gather that he has a loving presence. How are we able to gather that? Well, in the latter part of verse 28, he says, I will give you rest. Do we see that? We also see uh, in verse number 29, he says, learn from me. So in order to, one, one display of love is to give. We know that good Sunday school scripture, that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And we, when we love one another, we give to each other, whether it's our time, our talent, or our resources. So the Lord Jesus has a loving presence. And then furthermore, as we look at what he offers, he gives rest, but he also gives of himself. He says, learn from me or learn of me. Well, why is that important to learn from him and learn of him? Well, it's right there in verse 30 when we learn that he's meek and lowly. He says that our yoke will be easier and our burden will be light. Mm -hmm. So he says, look, look at me, learn about me. Would you? And then after you learn about me, you will be able to live a life with a easier yoke and a lighter burden. Just stay with me. I'll be there in a moment. All right. As we continue to go forward and we look at Jesus offering himself, uh, offering himself, I'm reminded of what he says in, uh, in John uh, verses number 13, verse 1, the Bible says, Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world unto the Father, having loved his own, which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. So what we see is that Jesus loved us, and he loves his way, well, loved his own, and he loved his own to the end. And even after he's finished his earthly work, the love that he offered is still available to us and for us. So what is the significance of Jesus? Why should we come to him? Why should we follow him? Why should we walk with him? Why should we accept his invitation? The reason being is because he's able to offer us something that no one else is able to offer. When we look at characteristics of good leaders, the reason they're able to gain influence so well is because they, they offer something that no one else is able to offer. David was a good leader. How do we know that? Well, people followed him. Why? Because of his military prowess. And in David, they saw a king who could give them a secure God-centered kingdom. If we look at our own history, Dr. Martin Luther King, why was he such an impactful leader? Because he was able to deliver the quality of, uh, a better quality of living, if you will, under the realm of integration. But we can go into detail about that because there are some things about, where well, I don't want to get too far off track. But we also, when we see it during, uh, during campaign season, we see politicians who are running for elected office, they promise to give something that no one else can give. Why? In hopes of gaining enough influence to get elected and placed in office. Well, when we look at our Jesus, the reason why he's such an impactful leader and such a change agent of the world is because he's able to give us something that nobody else can offer. Right. He's able to give us a love that is so unconditional that he laid down his life for us. In John chapter 15, verses 12 and following, he says, Greater love has no man than this than to lay down his life for his friend. Now, many of us will lay down our lives for our family, but I don't know if there are very many of us who would voluntarily lay down our lives for our friends. And I'm not just talking about the close friends, even the friends who may not be as close. You know, when it comes to family, it's a no-brainer. But when it comes to friend, I don't know. There's a bit more of a look. I see everybody shaking their heads this morning. It's a bit more of a hesitation there because there's no blood connection. 
Well, we have a connection with Christ through his blood. He, did, he made his blood available to us and for us so that we could be united with him. And now he serves as the barrier between us and spiritual danger. Am I making sense this morning? And so that's why in John chapter 10, he's, he's, refer, he's referred to as the good shepherd. We look at the way a shepherd positions himself. He's in front of his sheep sending a signal to all of the attackers that you got to go through me in order to get to the sheep. Yes. And the Lord Jesus himself, he wants us to know that if we are connected with him, amen, somebody, that in order for the devil to get to us, they got to go through him first. All right. He's able to offer us something that no one else can offer. Yeah. Now, as we look at this and we think about the time period in which they were living, and I'm not going to dwell on that for too long, they were living in a religiously oppressive environment we're familiar with it, how in the, during this time period, the old law was in place, and it was very restrictive. Wow. But you also had Pharisees who made life more complicated and more stringent than it already was under the old law. Mm -hmm. They took pride in being legalists. Mm -hmm. They took pride in making a person's religious commitment more difficult than God had made it. Mm -hmm. Let me say this again, because sometimes we can be, Pharise we can be like the Pharisees in the way that we behave. The Lord had already given some commandments. They were strict. They had. Uh, they they even demanded immediate consequences for sin. But the Pharisees said, "Well, you know what? We want to make it a little bit harder because <clears throat> some people, <clears throat> excuse me, believe that if something is more difficult, then it results in it being holier." Well, I want you to I want you to know this morning that nobody can get holier than heaven above. Amen. Nobody can get holier than that which God in heaven has provided for us. So if we want to add our stringent rules to something that's already perfect, let me let you in on a little bit of secret. We've tainted that which is perfect when we add our stringent rules to it. And my brothers and sisters in Christ, it is my prayer, it is my passionate prayer, that we will be alert enough and mature enough to appreciate what God has given us to the point to where we don't feel the need to add anything to it that he has not put in it already. Right. I know when we talk about adding to the word of God, those of you who grew up COC like I did, we automatically think about the things outside of the four walls of our church buildings. But there are some things that go on in our church buildings that we have, amen, somebody, that we have mandated for doctrine, even if we don't call it that. But how do we know we've mandated if we hadn't called it that? Because when we deviate from it, we're so strict to try to enforce it and correct it. Anyway, I believe you got the point right now. God has given us something pure. Let's thank him for what he has given us, live by it so that we can meet his face in peace on the other side. Amen. And so what Jesus says here, he says, I know that you are living in this environment that's polluted by religious tradition that has that, that, that have laws in addition to what has already been given. He said, but if you roll with me, I'm going to give you an easier life. He didn't say that the life would be easy. It would just be easier. Right. How so? Because we have a Savior who's lowly and meek enough to stand on side of us and get involved in our daily situations. And then he says, look at me. I'm an open book. I want you to learn about me. I want you to learn how to live like me, and I want you to learn how to live with me. Yes. And he said the result is, is your life's burden will be lighter. Amen. Let me help you understand where I'm coming from. Uh, every year in Houston, we have something, in the Houston area rather I should say, we have something called the Citywide Youth Lectureship. And I've been working with that event for some years now. And one year, I taught a high school class and one of the opening questions that I asked is, what was your greatest fear? And there were three young ladies in the class. Class was small that day. And when you look at it in the larger scheme of things, God arranged it that way because those three young ladies had the same answer and they almost teared up when they answered the question. And their greatest fear was going to hell. Let me stop right there for her. These ladies, these young ladies were baptized. These young ladies love the Lord as youth. You could hear it in their minds. You could observe it in their nonverbals. You could hear the passion in their voices. But they said that they went to bed every night wondering if they woke up the next morning, where would they end up? Well, what does that mean? That means that something along the way had caused them to view God as a policeman more so than a father. Boy, y'all so... He does enforce his 
his, his rules. Right, right. However, mm -hmm. he's not a policeman who's hanging out in the speed trap waiting for a reason to give us a ticket. All right. yeah. He wants us to be with him. How do we know that? Because he is our father. Yeah. When pa parenting, discipline is a part of the process. Correction is a part of the process. But discipline and correction is not to destroy the life of a child. It is to bring them up in a layman, somebody, in a way in which they can have a better life. And my church family, for too long, and members of we, members of the body of Christ, have made going to heaven so difficult until some people are afraid to go to sleep at night for fear of where they're going to wake up the next day. Right. has become so difficult to where people have had to take psychiatric medicine, amen somebody, because the burden of doing right, and this is not made up by the way, I've dealt with people who, who, who walk in these shoes, because the burden has been so heavy until their minds have been all messed up to where they needed some medication in order to function every day. But the Lord Jesus did not prepare a plan for us to follow to damage people. Right. We're in the business of building people up. Yeah. And how do we build people up? We build them up by sharing this pure and perfect message that we got from our Father in heaven above. Yeah. Right. Amen, yeah. Another thing we see about Jesus. Mm -hmm. Not only is his presence loving, but it's lowly. In Matthew chapter 9. Verses 10 and 11. The Bible says, And it came to pass, as Jesus sat at meat in the house, behold, many publicans and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said unto his disciples, Why eateth your master with publicans and sinners? Now, you had people who, were, who would be considered a spoke of low character, and Jesus sitting in the house chilling with them. Mm -hmm. People who would be considered of low character. Mm -hmm. And the Bible says that um, the Bible says that he sat at meat in the house. Everybody was hanging out. And Jesus hanging out with the fellows. Mm -hmm. Jesus hanging out with people of low character. Mm -hmm. Well, why did he do that? He did it first of all because he was lowly in heart. And secondly, he knew where he could make the most impact. All right. But let me tell you something about a lowly presence, church. Yeah. As we model the life of Jesus, a lowly presence is invigorating. If you want to energize people, be approachable. Because when we're not approachable, that can be discouraging. A lowly presence is impactful because people will listen to you and me when they feel like we can identify with them. A lowly presence is irresistible. Folks like being around people who are welcoming as opposed to people who are unwelcoming. I'll share a personal experience and I'm sure many of you can agree with it. I had an uncle who's deceased now, but we were really close. And you know, he was the uncle who, who when we'd go visit him, he'd take us out to get pizza and let us eat all we wanted. Yeah. And he'd let us drink as much soda as we wanted. Yeah. You know, your parents tell you, hey, you can't have too much of this, but, but my Uncle Alfred, who was living at the time, he, he'd let us just, just as some would say, Gorman dies profusely. That means eat too much, y'all. And then when we went home, you know, this was during the days when, when video games were relatively new, LaMarcus, he'd already have the racetrack set up for us because that was one of the indoor games that we played then. And that relationship was so close that even uh, after I'd become a young adult, a storm had come through the, uh, the area where he lived and we happened to be up there. And there, were no, there was no electricity, there was no, you know, electricity was out, no air condition, but I still wanted to be around my uncle. Why is that? Because his presence meant more to me than my own comfort. Yeah, yeah. And my brothers and sisters in Christ, being with Jesus should mean more to us than our own personal comfort. Yeah. And then as we look at the way we impact people, we should be lonely enough and humble and meek enough so that, people, so that people's desire to be around us mean more to them than their own comfort. Mm. If we want to get people to get to know Christ, then follow his example and be meek and lowly in heart. Yes. Mm -hmm. Thirdly, his presence is a leisure presence. 
Let me, let me connect the dots with this one. Let's look at verse number 29. He says, take my yoke upon you, learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you, this is the last, this is the part, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Leisure. How do you spend your leisure time? How, what do we do to relax? Some of us go on vacation. Some of us go hunting. Some of us go fishing. Some of us go to football games. Some of us go to video, some of us play video games. Some pre-COVID used to just walk around the mall even if we didn't spend any money. We have our own different ways of relaxing. And the Lord wants us to know that when we are with him, that we can relax. We don't have to be tense. We don't have to be uptight, but we can just relax. He says that he will give rest unto our souls. So not only is he able to put our mind at ease now, but we can wake up every day with an ease of mind, knowing that when eternity comes for us, that our souls will be able to rest in him. Yes. Isn't that a beautiful thing? Amen. The thing that we cannot control, that we cannot touch, our Jesus has taken care of it already. Yes. So we don't have to worry about it at all. Amen. He says, my yoke is easy. My burden is light. Now let me bring that up closer. Easy yoke. We know when we talk about yoke, it describes that thing that people would use to put a team of oxen together. Amen. And they would work. Yes. So if we're yoked, that doesn't mean that the work goes away. It just means that the work is a little easier. Why is the work a little easier? Because of the nature of the relationship. Let, let, me, let me help you understand where I'm coming from. For those of you who are, who've had to take care of a loved one who was sick, yes, it was inconveniencing, but because of the nature of the relationship, it didn't seem like work. Yes. Am I making sense this morning? Or yeah, those of you who have children, when your children need something, it's second nature for you to make sure that your children have what they need. Amen. Though it may be, inconvenience, be, be an inconvenience, but it doesn't feel like work. Uh, I remember I had gone to a funeral once and a lady's daughter had passed. The daughter was an adult and her mother was a primary caregiver. It wasn't a sudden death. She had a, uh, she had a condition that resulted in her dying. But the mother repeatedly said that never once did she get tired of taking care of her daughter. Mm -hmm. And my church family, we who are in the Lord's vineyard, who are his servants and his workers, serving him shouldn't feel like work. Right. Why? Because of the nature of the relationship. Yes, what do you mean by that, Brother Moore? Well, he's given us a, uh, an easy yoke and a lighter burden. Mm -hmm. And what should keep us going is how our lives would be if we didn't have that easy yoke and didn't have that light of burden. Yes, that means we would have a hard yoke and we would have a heavier burden. Yes, and so serving and working in the service of someone who loves us, cherishes us, and cares about us the way Jesus does, yes. it shouldn't make work feel like work. Right. In other words, it should just be a natural part of our lives where we do what we do because of who we are and because of who we he, who he is, excuse me y'all, I got a little tongue twisted, because of who he is, because of who we are to him, and because of who he is to us. The presence of Jesus. You know, there are a whole lot of things that we can say about the Lord's presence, because he's not a limited being. He's a being who is unlimited, which means that there's no limit to what he's able to offer. Amen. I mean, so, you know, these are just three facets of his uh, presence. But as I get ready to close, I'm reminded of some songs that, that, are, that we've sung or heard in our lifetime that describes what it means to be in the presence of the Lord. There's one song entitled, The Presence of the Lord is Here. And the way the song goes, it says, everybody blow the trumpet and sound the alarm. Because the Lord is in the temple, let everybody bow. Let all the people praise him now. The Lord is here. I can feel the presence of the Lord. And I'm going to get my blessing right now. 
when we're in the Lord's presence, we should know that not only is he loving, lowly, and leisure, but he's still in the blessing business. Even when we don't readily see the fruit of the blessing, just know that he's working on a blessing for us. There's another song that was popular a while back, Take Me to the King. It says, truth is I'm weak, no strength to fight, no tears to cry. Have you ever cried so much until you were all cried out? Even if I tried, but still my soul refuses to die, one touch will change my life. Not, long, not only is his presence loving, lowly, and leisure, but his presence is a life-changing experience. But then there's a song that many of us grew up singing that says, when a heart is broken up with a tearful, lonesome cup, then's the time to go to Christ alone. In our blessed Lord divine, there is peace and joy sublime when we take our sorrows all to him alone. There are days I like to be all alone with Christ. I tell him all my, amen somebody, all alone. So not only is he loving, lowly, and leisure, but he's able to provide us a peace of mind when we have a lot of things bouncing around in our heads. As I get ready to close, the Jesus that we serve is a Jesus who loves, cares, and cherishes us. Look at the things that he did in the scripture. He met the Hebrew boys in the fiery furnace. As a member of deity, he escorted David through the valley of the shadow of death. He was the rock who followed Moses in the wilderness. He's the one who we're able to give our burdens to and he's able to carry them. That's why I want us to be reminded today that even though life may get difficult sometimes, we have an advocate who can give us a better life in the person of Jesus Christ. Amen. He still says, come unto me, all you who labor and who are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. The rest that he gives is not like the rest that you get in the hotel where you got to check out by a certain time. Oh, yeah. The rest that he gives is a daily rest. Mm -hmm. And that daily rest that he gives us is preparing us to take part in that eternal rest that he prepared for us when he got up out of the grave more than 2,000 years ago. And I invite each of us to go ahead and give him a chance today. I know sometimes we look at ourselves and say, I messed up. I'm not as good as I should be. But all we got to do is repent with a sincere heart and everything is all good with him. He doesn't hold grudges like some of us do. He doesn't hold grudges like some people we know do. I shouldn't have indicted all of us did. Right? He doesn't hold grudges like some people we know do. As long as we're committed enough to admit our mess ups and try, and try harder the next day, everything is all good with him. So don't worry about the dirt in your closet. Don't worry about the bones you have buried. Don't worry about the things that you wish you could have changed because if you've done them already, you can't go back in time and change them anyway. Right. Just go ahead and honor that commitment and take advantage of the privileges that we have and enjoy in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah and praise God. Amen. As I get ready to close, if there's someone here today who's not yet named the name of Christ, you do that by having faith, repenting of sin, confess, uh, repenting of sin, and confessing Him as Lord in Christ, and being baptized in water for the remission of sin. And for those of us who are Christians, who've walked with Him, and sometimes we forget what He has to offer, things can distract us until we take our eyes off. Sometimes, and it's happened to us before. If it happened to, you, if it has not happened to you yet, just keep on living. And one day you go wake up and say, you know what? I was told that this was going to happen one day. But guess what, church? He still loves us. He's faithful. And he's just to forgive us of our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. All we got to do is just trust him to do it. And if we have a problem that's not a sin problem, just a life problem, he can give us guidance to do that. He gives us guidance through his word. He blesses us with people. And then he also uses time to heal us. Let me say that again. He gives guidance through his word. He blesses us with people in our lives. And then he's also able to use time to heal us. The Bible still says, they that wait on the Lord, he shall renew their strength. That's the time factor. Right now we may feel battered and bruised, but just hold on and don't give up on him. And in a matter of time, everything will be all right. Just, just take him at his word and trust him on today. And if you need prayer and encouragement, the invitation is for you. 
If you need baptism, the invitation is for you. Go ahead and stand up to your feet right now when we sing. There is a name I love to hear.